The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. We look at stories from business leaders who've dealt with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, how they fell down, how they pick themselves up, and how they hope workplaces can change in the future. Perhaps my favorite moment in today's interview is when our guest, Mark Brackett, admits that people with entitled attitudes really, really set him off. I'm triggered easily, he says. He just puts it out there. Mark has a lot of triggers based on his upbringing. And here's a newsflash. Your boss gets triggered too. It happens to most of us. We're triggered consciously and unconsciously all the time at work. And although we use the term colloquially, in psychological terms, a trigger is something intense It's a stimulus. It could be a smell, a sound, a sight, another person's actions that triggers feelings of trauma. You may recall my interview with Afghan war veteran Jason Kander, who talked about his inability to sit down with anyone in back of him at a restaurant, for example, until he got treatment for his PTSD. But in smaller ways, many of us are being set off all day long and reenacting bad habits or old defense mechanisms with our teams and at work. You know, triggers can be small. You you might notice that your stomach flips or you feel a feeling of dread when you see a certain word or someone's name pop up in your inbox. They might be bigger. When unemployment numbers skyrocket, you might feel nauseous and unable to focus, even though you still have a job and nothing in your life has changed. So here's a challenge. When an interaction or a situation sets you off, examine why. The unresolved business from your past, as we'll hear from Mark Brackett today, is present in and relevant to how we all work and lead. Mark Brackett, Ph.D., is the founder and director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and a professor in the Child Study Center of Yale University. He is the lead developer of RULER, an evidence-based approach to social and emotional learning that's been adopted by nearly 2,000 schools globally. And it's great for adults, too. His book, Permission to Feel, is one of my favorites. Well, how are you, Mark? And, and of course, I, I asked that. I should probably ask maybe where you are on, your, on the mood meter right now. And maybe you could explain what that is and why it's important to be specific. All right, that's going to take the whole hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to say, like, I am... Personally, emotionally, kind of all over the place. Um, I feel right now in my life I'm chronically overwhelmed, Mm. angry at a lot of things, sad at other things, anxious about other things. And so um, I'm glad I have a sophisticated emotion vocabulary, though, (laughs) Uh, so I can communicate, you know, effectively. Not that everybody wants to listen, Uh, which is getting at, you know, your question, really. You know, this question, you know, how are you feeling? It can be a loaded question, right? Because there's assumptions made, right? That A, the person asking really cares. B, that the person who is being asked is self-aware. And C, that the person who asked the question is willing to listen, mm-hmm. right? And support what they hear. And so I think that's why many of us go through life kind of saying, how's it going? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then we say fine and we move on. But for me, granularity in terms of being emotionally self-aware is really important because you have to label your feelings to know what to do with your feelings. And that's why we have the tool like the mood meter, which is the key tool to our approach to teaching emotional intelligence. And, you know, put simply, the mood meter is, you know, sort of a box that has, you know, four color boxes in it. As I tell people, it's a deceptively simple tool because to really use it wisely, you have to understand the core principles of emotional awareness. So first on the x-axis is the word pleasantness. Mm. And think about it. You wake up in the morning. 
and you're doing some kind of reflection typically, right? Do I want to approach the day? Do I want to avoid the day? Do I feel safe? Do I feel unsafe? Do I feel pleasant? Do I feel unpleasant? And then you're checking in with your body a little bit, like, do I feel energized today or do I feel really tired and depleted today? And it's those two axes that together form the four quadrants. We got the yellow, the red, the blue, and the green. Mm. So yellow, high energy and pleasant, right? Emotions like happy and excited and jubilant and elated and ecstatic. The green, pleasant, but lower in energy, calm, content, tranquil, peaceful, relaxed. And then the blue and the red, I just want to say up front, they're called negative emotions, which I think is a bad term. They're not bad emotions. They're just unpleasant feelings. So the red quadrant, right? Unpleasant, high in energy. So, you know, the anxiety family, the anger family. And then the blue, you know, which is that lower left, are the emotions that are unpleasant but lower in energy. So you can think about sadness, loneliness, you know, depression, despair, etc. So explain how understanding how to understand and label how you feel is a leadership skill. Because I think that that is one of the most important messages that I took away from your book. And, and there's a lot of data here. There is. And so, you know, for leaders that are listening, what I would say is, you know, I've done a lot of consulting for big companies, whether they be tech companies like Microsoft and Google and Pinterest and Twitter, financial companies, I won't mention them. <laughs> um, you know, the attitude is wide ranging. You know, I remember going to this one, you know, very elite hedge fund and, um, you know, I think the person said to me something like, interesting talk, you know, Mark, but like, I don't need these skills. I mean, look at my office. <laughs> it was big, I take it. Yeah, it was a big corner office, you know, on the Hudson River. And I was like, tell me more. <laughs> You know, and, you know, he's like, maybe I'll bring you in to train the people who work for me because then they'll have the skills to deal with me. And I remember thinking, like, I cannot wait to do these interviews. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people have this, like, misconception of emotional intelligence, oftentimes because of its popularization, right, that it's, like, about charisma. You know, it's about, quote, unquote, being successful. Well, it's about sales. I think that people understand the role of, of sort of EQ in sales, but they don't necessarily see beyond that. Exactly. My question for people is, do you know how the people feel who work for you? Most people are like, what are you talking about? Well, you know, I look around, you know, and I say, well, looking at people's facial expressions and body language is like you're, you know, you're going to probably get it wrong more than 50% of the time. In a big study that we did with about 15,000 people across the workforce, we looked at supervisor emotionally intelligent behavior, like really about how skilled was the supervisor in, you know, demonstrating that they care for others, how skilled was the supervisor around regulating their own feelings when they were stressed out and overwhelmed or angry. And then when we're curious, you know, were there differences in groups hmm. when this supervisor had higher versus lower emotion skills? And it was remarkable. I mean, like, honestly, 50% difference in feelings of inspiration among the employees. Wow. They were 50% higher when you work for someone who was higher in emotional intelligence. So by way of example, people said they felt inspiration about 25% of the time when they worked for someone who was low in emotional intelligence. And seventy five percent of the time when they work for someone higher in emotional intelligence. I mean, think about how inspiration might play out in a company in terms of creativity, productivity, relationships. Energy. Energy, all of that. And then we found frustration was the opposite, right? That they were it was like sixty to seventy percent of the time they felt frustrated and only thirty to forty percent of the time um in you know, the uh, groups where there was an emotionally intelligent supervisor. And then we looked at things like engagement and burnout, intentions to leave the profession, ethical behavior, and all in the expected directions. Huh. You know, organizations that have leaders with higher emotional intelligence have companies and employees who function better and perform better. So I have a I have a sort of nitty gritty question, which is something I think about, because I think that there's there's, to me, there's the emotional um, intelligence of understanding how people react to me mm -hmm. in a work setting. 
then there's the larger situation of how people who work for me feel outside of me, right? Are they are they anxious in their everyday life? Are they going through a hard personal moment? What does a leader need to focus on first? Like if you're kind of like, all right, I'm going to become an emotion scientist. Do you start with really understanding yourself and how you might make other people feel? Or do you think about how do I understand the whole lives of the people who work for me? Does that make it's sense? Both. It's yeah, both. and I love that you use the term in my book, emotion scientist, <laughs> um, because that's my goal is to make or help everyone become an emotion scientist as opposed to what I call the emotion judge. I'm going to go into a different arena for a minute, sure. parenting. Mm-hmm. You know, Parents come to these trainings that we do, and they say things like, teach me how to make my kid more emotionally intelligent. And then they leave saying, oh, crap, I got a lot of work to do on myself. <laughs> because <laughs> they think that I'm like, it reminds me when I, I, I my other background is in martial arts. Mm. Parents used to drop off their kids to my martial arts studio and say, teach my kid discipline. And I'm like, you know, I got them for one hour a week. Well, how about I teach them martial arts and you teach them discipline? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, in the workplace, it's the same thing, is that we as managers, as leaders, we have to be emotionally intelligent role models. Hmm. You know, That's how, hard. It's hard because we haven't had an emotion education. You know, since most people who are managing companies and leading companies didn't have that emotion education, we got to start where they're at. So with that said, you know, firstly, it's never too early, never too late to start working on these skills. So I just want to put that out there. The areas of our brain responsible for building emotion vocabulary and learning strategies to manage our feelings are, are there and ready for us to, you know, fill it in. So A, role model, right? Be the role model, right? Do you create the space for your own emotions, but you also create the space for other people to talk about their feelings? Mm-hmm. And it's a good example, actually, that I have um, from my own center. And I'm talking behind my executive director's back right now, who is from the business world, and he's a friend, <laughs> and he knows that I'm going to say this story because it's one of our little jokes. So um, Scott is a great guy, and he's been my, you know, is my co-director, um, but he comes from Wall Street. Mm. And after his like first month, he came to my office and he said to me something like, all right, what's the deal here? How much time do I need to spend in meetings checking in with how people are feeling? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, a lot more than you're used to. Um, and so that's an important point, though, because, you know, there's a lot, there can be too much feeling, right? Like right. we do have work to do. Right. It's not my job to deal with all of your emotions like we are in a workplace and we have to learn how to manage our own feelings and but of course we have to create environments where people feel safe and connected and supported and valued and heard because that just exacerbates negative feelings if it's not there and so you know my argument to most leaders um as a matter of fact i just did this maybe two days ago with a very big company Um, and I had the C-suite, and I built what I call the emotional intelligence charter with them, Mm. because we're going to be doing this project for a long period of time. And I said, tell me, how do you want to feel? Like, how do you want to feel working on this team together? And people were like, what are you talking about? (laughs) I'm like, I really want to know. Like, this is hard work, and we're going to be doing, like, major things together. How do we want to feel working on a team? And we came up with very interesting words like connected, supported, heard, valued, creative, inspired. And then the next question is, well, what do we got to do to get there? So what are the indicators for that? How are we going to evaluate how our team is functioning? You can imagine, you know, that not everyone would be comfortable facilitating that conversation right you need a little bit of emotional intelligence to be comfortable even leading that conversation yeah i just think that we miss so much by not making sure that we check in with feelings in the workplace when you're working on this stuff with big companies do you feel like you have to spend time convincing them that this is good for their bottom line or do they sort of get it that like, oh, emotions might make it better to work here. Like, what's the balance? It's a normal distribution. 
So it's that bell I, curve. I failed. St- okay, thanks. I was going to say, did not do that well in statistics. So it's okay. I've taught statistics, so I can actually explain it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what I mean by that is that it's like a third kind of like get out of my face. A third are kind of neutral, and a third are like, give me more, give me more, give me more. And does it have to do with the level of power? Because you, you say actually in your book that people with more, I, mean, I want to read it because I actually have the page open, page 234. Uh, research shows that high power individuals tend to be less responsive to the motions of people around them. So are the, is it the, is it the yeah. high power people who are like, nah, don't need this? Or do they just follow all along the bell curve? There's probably, you know, if you do the bell curve, you know, within the high power people, it's a little (laughs) skewed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting when you think about power, right? Because high power people don't necessarily think that they need people. Like Mm -hmm. when you're lower on the totem pole, you really need a lot of resources, right? And supports to get to where you are. But once you reach the top, you're kind of on the top. Mm. It's totally wrong thinking because... What you don't realize is that you've got, you know, 40,000 people that report to you that, you know, actually are really making a difference or not in terms of, you know, your company's success. But we don't think of it that way because we're very individualistic in our society. But one of the coolest things that you say, and I loved this, is that you talk about how um, understanding emotions can help with leadership emergence. And I don't know if I read that right, but I liked to think about that as um, when people are newer leaders, they could have an edge and gain more influence even than, than their stodgy boss if they do have that emotional intelligence and can understand feelings better and um, and work through that. You know, as an aspiring leader myself, you know, I consider myself always being in learning mode. Um, You know, I became a professor because I wanted to walk around campus and, you know, talk with my students about life. And (laughs) and now, you know, I don't really teach very much anymore. And I run a center with 60 employees. Right. You know, when you're younger and you're newer in your work, dealing with conflict is not as challenging. Hmm. Um, But now, you know, have a leadership team and you want to use more distributive leadership and and then you have people who don't agree with each other and have people who have different personalities and people who want to be heard more and people who want their voices and the list goes on. And you're stuck with these like, what do I do? How do I manage this? And can I just make the decision? Because I'm like, don't want to wait any longer. Right. These are all like emotion focused challenges, right? They're not cognitive challenges. And I just don't think that we prepare people enough mm. to reflect on that. Um, you know what I'm reminded of mm. is how um, many years ago I had someone working with me who was difficult. Let's put it that way. And uh, and essentially what I learned was that that person told the people who reported to the person that, um, like, if you have a problem with me, like, you deal with it with me. You're like, you don't go to Mark. He's too busy. Hmm. So a lot of dysfunction happened on this one team that I was completely unaware of. And then when this person ended up leaving, all the people that reported came to me and said, oh my God, you know, we were so unhappy and, you know, we wanted to speak to you, but we were afraid we were going to lose our jobs because of it. Mm. And so in many ways, I feel bad, you know, that I didn't develop this person better. Or, you know, had more, you know, it's time to spend with this person to develop you know, their emotion skills. Because as, as, as an emerging leader, you know, in our center, A, you know, it ended up not working out for this person, but B, like employees really suffered and they were spending a lot of time looking for other jobs. I didn't know any of it. And and I think that's the thing is that this stuff is hard and people are a pain in the ass, you know, like it takes effort. And when life is hard and you're tired and sometimes you just want to go home. You, you don't want to hear someone else's problems. You have an anecdote in the book I want I wanted you to talk about. Um, you had a student who was really arrogant. And she wrote you a crummy note and didn't do her exam. And then she said she wanted to work for you. And she was really entitled. And, and the, you decided to chase her down and try to figure out what was going on. Um, <laughs> why did you do this? Like, why did you spend time figuring out what was going on with this one arrogant and entitled student? And like, what parallels does that have for managers? 
Well, you know, it goes back to like, Mark, what is your job? Oh, you're the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, because I have, you know, I grew up in with very humble roots. You know, my neither one of my parents went to college. You know, my father was an air conditioning repairman. Mm. So, and now I work at an Ivy League university where you know people's upbringings were mostly very different from my own. Mm. And so I don't, I don't relate well to entitlement. Like I had a really, you know, you know, bust my, you know, what, you know, out of you know, my whole life, you know, and nothing was really given to me. And I didn't even know what Yale was, to be honest with you, when I was growing up. You're it just like a foreign country. Wow. And I never would have thought, even if I knew what it was, I didn't think I was somebody who belonged there. <laughs> and so now I'm a full professor there. <laughs> and um, I'm triggered easily, you know, and because, you know, Entitlement I'm Entitlement triggers you. It's one of my big triggers. Mm. And, um, and so this particular student basically just was dismissive and you know and then she didn't show up for the exam and i said you know you know i'm not sure what's going on here and and she said something you know like well um i think it was something like well you're just such a fun professor i didn't think you would really care <laughs> i'm like really <laughs> um and then wrote me a letter where it said i am so effing this and effing that and I'm like i cannot believe this uh, is I happening i cannot believe that she put that in an email crazy and so I think that the, where this can be a teachable moment for people is that I have a lot of triggers, you know, based on my upbringing. Mm. We all do, whether we're conscious of them or not. Mm. And so entitlement is one of my triggers. Another one of them, because I grew up, you know, very low middle class, I didn't have a lot of money, is like being ripped off. Like going out for coffee right now is a trigger for me. <laughs> Spending five seventy five on a cappuccino could make me, you know, like become like a, I don't know what. So anyway, but I take my breath and like, Mark, right, you can afford it, but I don't want to spend it. And I get angry and it's like a whole thing. But anyway, this is a so, too psychodynamic. So, no, I love it. I love it because imagine, I would imagine if your staff orders like a really extravagant catered lunch for something, does that like trigger you? Totally. Yeah. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, even when my partner does it, I get irritated. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, peeling sweet potatoes at home while you're traveling and like going out for your like lobster. And, you know, <laughs> I'm like, this is like, there's something wrong here. Anyway, um, you know, I don't need your audience to, to, to manage, help me manage my feelings. But going back to this example, I think that we don't realize as leaders and managers that we are triggered either consciously or subconsciously, all the time at yeah. work. By the way someone talks, by the, by the way someone acts, by the way someone you know shows up late and doesn't say anything, the list goes on. And what happens is it builds up inside of us, right? It's like you accumulate this debt you know, of anger or anxiety or whatever it might be. And then it shows up in weird places like at the bar every night having your fifth you know, martini. <laughs> Uh, or in displacing that anger, you know, with Yelling our family Yelling at your members. partner, yeah. Totally. And so, like, this is life. The reason why I bring this, these examples up is that, A, like my student, A, maybe she's suffering, which I found out she was. Mm -hmm. You know, but the story of the student was that she grew up in a family where it was like a, a mom who was just way overly attached and had these, like, fears of death, and her mother was calling her regularly, checking in with her, because her mother's mother died while she was a, a college student and so wow. this particular mother was afraid that she was going to die before her daughter graduated college so she just wanted to connect with her every single day and control her and so you wonder why this kid is freaking out every day and doesn't know her you know so all of a sudden my anger for her turned into deep empathy and compassion which then you know helped me to problem solve with her a little bit and you know I feel obligated as a professor at my university. I want our graduates to leave, you know, making a great impression on people. And I want her to achieve her dreams. So what can I do, right, to help her become more aware of the impact that she's having on other people? Every leader should make that their goal. Because A, like you sleep better at night when you help other people out. And B, it's going to just help you have a better organization. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days. 
all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise. A promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. A promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. You say that the thing that keeps you up at night is how your employees feel. Not, not if your grants will come through or if your center is doing a good job, but if how your people feel. Because I know if they're feeling more pleasant than unpleasant feelings, not, they're not going to get, nobody's, nobody's not going to be anxious right now. Mm. Right? So that's okay. But I want them to feel more pleasant mm. than unpleasant emotions at work. Because I know that how they feel drives everything from their attentional capacity to their decision making to the quality of their relationships. I mean, think about it. You know, how many of us like to work with a dysregulated colleague? Mm. And like when you wake up in the morning, you don't say to yourself, oh, I want to be productive today. I want to be creative today. I'm going to create a new vision for my team. No, you say to yourself, oh, I got a stomach ache. Oh, I can go in late. Or, you know what, let me look on Facebook or, you know, what? I'm going to look on, you know, whatever site to see if there's other positions like mine somewhere else. Right. Or you avoid them. Right. You just totally avoid them. All the time. I've had I've for years because I'm conflict avoidant. That's one thing I've learned about myself. One of my favorite, you know, examples of emotional intelligence in my organization. Years ago, I had someone as an intern who had like a major personality disorder and, you know, I empathize with that. But at the same time, it can be very disruptive. Mm-hmm. to an organization and long story short is we're in a meeting and this person looks at me and he goes if you don't start listening to me i predict your center is gonna crumble <gasps> right and i was like okay like what's going on here and then my assistant at the time she's got a lot of agency mm-hmm. and she stood up she goes you can't talk to mark that way <laughs> <laughs> thinking to myself like i gotta go to lunch or something like, i'm out of here and <laughs> Um, anyway, it was like one of those moments in my career. I'm like, what is happening in here? And who's in charge, by the way? Like, and how's this, what's going to happen with this person? Like, how am I going to get them out of here? How am I going to de- deactivate them? And what am I going to do with my assistant? Like, it's, it was a big deal. What'd you do? Uh, the truth is, um, I was so caught off guard and I didn't really want to deal with it because I didn't know how to deal with it in the moment. I just, I said, oh my goodness, it's, I, have a, I had a lunch meeting. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and I was like, you know what, we, we really can't go there right now, but, well, you know, I'll come back. And I went for lunch and I called my friend Doug, who is a clinical psychologist. I'm like, Doug, help me out. I don't want to go back to my own office. <laughs> and anyway, you know, and it gave, I needed that space. I needed the space. And that's another lesson is that you can't always solve your emotional challenges in the moment, especially when you're really activated. Mm. You got to step back. You got to breathe. And sometimes you just need some help. And I worked through it and I went back and I was like, we got to talk about what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a lot of layers to this. And then it didn't work out. And I had to let this person just know that they were not welcome back in the center ever again. Because it was, I didn't realize there were things happening again. This is another example. Like then my assistant said, you know, a lot of people having difficulty with him. He's very, you know, like not a good listener and, you know, challenges people without really knowing what he's talking about. So... But did that make you feel guilty also? Like you're supposed to be this master of emotional intelligence and you run, you know, I mean, and and yet this person still had to go. Like you couldn't fix them. Well, we can't fix people. We can't fix ourselves either, right? Damn. Um, And, you know, part of it is, is this is hard. It's hard to make decisions in life. And, you know, this was an intern who, you know, wasn't a full employee, so it was a little bit easier. Mm. You know, one thing that I've learned through my own personal life is that sometimes we stay in relationship with people for too long. Mm. You know, that's when emotional intelligence becomes self... uh, It's not not emotional intelligence. It's when we become, in many ways, Mm self-saboteurs because we make excuses oh, you know, maybe this one happened and maybe that and maybe this and maybe that. And then it's five years later, we don't want to go to work or we, you know, don't talk to our significant others. I think that part of being emotionally intelligent is recognizing that sometimes you have to make really difficult decisions that don't benefit everybody. 
and I didn't do it in a nasty and I didn't yell at this person and say, you're this and this. I was very clear. You know, this is not behavior that is accepted here. And, um, and because I had learned there was a history of it that, again, people didn't tell me. And it drives me, it actually drives me crazy. I just had to say this because, like, I feel, and again, this is my self-report, which might be overrated, that, um, like, I try to send messages all the time to my team. Like, tell me what's going on, please. I want to hear. Mm-hmm. And I just think that people have been born into this culture, at least in America, where it's like they just don't want to do it. They don't want to, you know, share the negativity. They don't want to. Maybe it means that they don't know how to deal with it and they don't want to look like they're not skilled. And that's why I try to, you know, I use millions of anecdotes of my own experiences to let people know, you know, this is really hard and it's okay to mess up. So, um... And I think in many organizations, like, for example, at a place like Yale, where I work, um, like, there's this, like, thing that you have to be brilliant, Mm -hmm. you know, and that you can't let, like, like, how could I let the professor know that I don't understand something? That means that I'm, like, you know, inferior, and I, I don't really belong, and I'm an imposter. You know, I just think, this is why we need all this work on emotional intelligence, is because we've been nurtured in systems that make us think that being anxious and angry, you know, are bad things. What's the beauty of understanding how you feel? Does it inspire creativity or passion? Like, like how can really understanding how your emotions feed into all your other systems make your work life richer? Because emotions are information. Hmm. They're a guide. And when we become compassionate emotion scientists, as opposed to critical emotion judges for ourselves and other people, right, it opens up all the possibilities. You know, and for a leader, um, you know, for me, by way of example, being granular and specific about my feelings is information. It says, you know, Mark, maybe this is, you're not going, you know, this is the wrong path for you. Mm-hmm. But don't just go with your gut instinct. Really di- like, dissect it a little bit. Is it just your fear of failure showing up here? Or is this really something that you just don't want to do and believe is a dangerous way, you know, forward? Or if I notice that I'm not feeling inspiration or excitement for a while, it's like, all right, well, how is that? impacting you know my creativity in the writing that i'm doing in the way i'm managing people and what do i need to get there Mm -hmm. so the reason why labeling your emotions is so important is that it gives us a clue into you know what's happening for us and then we have to ask ourselves questions as those emotion scientists like is this feeling helpful for my task at hand for my writing today or my running a meeting or when I do a presentation, you know, what I was telling someone the other day is that, you know, someone like me who's been doing this for a while, um, like so, what I do oftentimes is redundant hmm. and it's not exciting mm-hmm. just to be straightforward, you know, like the mood meter, for example, I love the mood meter, but do you know how many times I've talked about the mood meter? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could have nightmares about the mood meter. <laughs> um, but yet, you, you know, your readers or listeners, I should say, you know, um, they don't know about it necessarily. So then I have to reframe, you know, like I may enter into something, you know, where I'm like, ugh. And I have to say, all right, Mark, how is that ugh going to impact the podcast? How is it going to impact the performance? How is it going to impact my evaluation of this person's grant proposal or whatever it is? And then I'm, I sit with it and I'm like, all right, what feeling is going to best serve the audience? What feeling is going to best serve the meeting? And that tells me whether I can stay or shift. And if I need to shift, then I have to find out what that journey is going to look like. Do I need to do like listen to some you know music to pump me up? Do I need to engage in a reappraisal? 
like for example, I'm making this up right now because I'm actually really enjoying this. Um, but if I were really like dreading it, I might say, well, listen, like, wow, Mark, you're going to get a whole new audience of people to hear about your work. That's cool. Yeah. So let me think about that. Not the, you know, I have to talk about the same thing for the 15,000th time. <laughs> Do you see what I'm getting at? Well, it's so funny. And I'm, and I, A, I'm so glad you said that because I think we all feel that, especially at a certain point in our career. But but I want to share with you that when, uh, before we spoke, I was feeling really depressed. It's been it's been a really hard time, I think, for all of us. And, mm-hmm. and I actually thought about canceling because I was feeling so low. I thought, mm. how am I going to be able to fake my voice? <laughs> yeah. But being, but learning from you, even though it's the 35,000th time you've talked about this, it's new to me. And I'm so drawn in by it that my mood now is renewed. That's the label I would put. I feel full of um, inspiration, and I want this to be a really good podcast, and I care again. And that's just because I just spent time with you. So, well, thanks. See yeah. that now? <laughs> now I'm going to leave here feeling like satisfied and <laughs> and relieved, and you know, like have I have renewed purpose. So, thank you. Well, that's it for this week's show. Thank you to my producer, Mary Dew. Thank you to the team at HBR and the studio team who make the audio happen, especially in these challenging times. I'm so grateful to our guests for sharing their experiences and for you, the listeners. Please send me feedback if you want to hear. I've gotten some great feedback over the break, which I'll be incorporating. You can email me at anxiousachiever at gmail.com or tweet me at moraam, M-O-R-R-A-A-M. And if you love the show, tell your friends, subscribe or leave a review. From HBR Presents, this is Maura Aarons-Mealy. <laughs>